So the second study was, again, looking at cats with DKA, but a little bit different protocol. And so this study was comparing the use of galarginine as well as regular insulin um, therapy compared to continuous rate infusion of regular insulin in a sliding scale, so much like the, last, the previous study we just spoke about. So when we look at the treatment of DKA, regular insulin is a very common therapy. The most common therapy at uh, referral hospitals uh, with a 24-hour ICU is going to be a sliding scale continuous infusion. However, if there are cats that are um, less affected or um, less severely affected or clinician preference, other routes may be used with regular insulin, and that can include both intramuscular or subcutaneous. Glargenine, however, is either used as an intramuscular injection or potentially subcutaneous injection. And so these are two different insulins in that the glargenine is considered a longer acting insulin compared to the regular insulin, um, which may only last about four to six hours. And so this study was evaluating these two insulins together when compared to the kind of standard of care for this particular study, which was the regular sliding scale insulin um, CRI. So the first protocol was eight cats were included in the low-dose regular insulin CRI, again, on a sliding scale. And this insulin was um, dosed at one unit per keg per day, diluted into 240 mils, run at 10 mils per hour. So very similar to the lower-dose insulin group in the last study we spoke about. This group of cats was compared to another group of eight where they got intermittent short and long-acting insulin, and this included glargenine at 0.25 units per keg sub-Q every 12 hours, as well as regular insulin, one unit IM, up to every six hours, or if the blood glucose was above 250 milligrams per deciliter. Dextrose was added in either patient group if the blood sugar was less than 250. In particular, the study was looking at the time to normalization of the following parameters, so pH, bicarb, hyperglycemia, which was defined as a blood glucose less than 250, ketonemia, and appetite, as well as the duration of hospitalization between the two groups. The results showed pretty similar, um, a greater than 50% survival onto discharge compared to the previous study. There was no difference in either treatment group, and there was no difference in appetite or time to first meal. However, the sub-Q IM group, which was the glargine group, did have a significantly shorter time to normalization or resolution time of all of the parameters noted, hyperglycemia, ketonemia, pH, and bicarb. And they also had a shorter hospitalization, um, pretty significant numbers there, um, 54 hours compared to the CRI group, which is 111 hours. And so I think when we're kind of getting back to clinical applications of studies, this may become a, a nice protocol to do in hospital because ultimately it may get our patients out of the hospital sooner, which is kind of bottom line for a lot of our clients when finances are mainly out of pocket. So conclusions noted that intermittent short and long-acting insulin injections appear to be effective for treatment of DKA in cats. In particular, there was a significantly shorter hospitalization time in this group. Other advantages at this point were um, speculated but unable to be um, defined until further research is done because we only had a group of eight cats in each um, study group. And although the subcutaneous and the um, IM injections may be less labor intensive, it just really depends on how your ICU protocol is, is run for DKA cats. I think a lot of my ICU nurses feel that once the insulin CRI is set up, it's very simple and it kind of runs on its own as long as you're monitoring glucose in either of these categories, either the CRI group or the IM sub-Q group we're still going to have to be monitoring glucose, and you know, we're still going to have to be watching those patients very closely. However, however, we may be saving our clients money if we're able to get those cats out of the hospital sooner. So in general, since reading this study, our hospital uses the 2.2 unit per keg per, um, per day rate for insulin, and we do a sliding scale insulin CRI, which is um, very, um, mostly technician-driven, so it's a, a protocol that is run by our ICU nurses, 
and then if there's any questions or concerns, um, the doctor's consulted. But other than that, um, the, for the most part, the nurses are running that. So I think that certainly um, makes it a little easier for ICU as a group. However, since reading this study, um, we have started in a small number of patients using the glargenine IM at sub-2, and we've had great success. Um, and so I think that either option is very is feasible, just depending on what your comfort level is. Um, but I, I don't know if Dr. Zanger has any um, experience with the glargenine and the sub-2 regular insulin. Um, by chance, I don't know if, if prior to or after reading this article, if she's been using that protocol. Yeah, so this data actually um, was presented in a similar fashion from actually a different group, but they had very similar results, and it was presented at ACVM about five years ago. And I, um, being an internist, I'm usually not starting a lot of DKAs because those are coming through the emergency room, but I, I remember one patient um, that it was a, coming to me for a recheck. It was an existing diabetic that came in very ill, and she was di uh, DKA, and I thought, you know, I'm going to try this new Glargine um, protocol, and that cat went from being, you know, completely dehydrated and half dead to looking pretty darn good in 24 hours, and I was, I was really, really impressed. Um, both of these articles are really timely for me. Last week we had three DKAs in the hospital, two dogs, or two cats and one dog. Um, I have one in today, actually, and I started um, using Glargine uh, as soon as the case was transferred to me this morning, even though the cat's um, you know, ketones have not resolved. The cat was just brought in last night. Um, and that cat actually, again, is looking pretty good and was looking at food um, towards late in the afternoon. So I was, I was pretty impressed with, with that. I don't have a, necessarily a good explanation, but I guess we don't really care at this point. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think the the biggest thing that we see um, with the sliding scales is, you know, every doctor has a little bit different sliding scale. There's not a, a standard of care. We don't all use the same one. Um, so our emergency doctors may use one a little bit different than our ICU doctors. Um, and just kind of subjectively, when I look at those, sometimes there's some large swings in the glucose when you're using those glucose curves or life happens and things are getting crazy and there's an emergency and the nurses miss an hour treatment or they, you know, they're two hours behind or you know, they forget to change the insulin CRI. And so you know, certainly those things can happen, we're all human. Um, but with the sub-Q and the IM injections, I think you, you do have a little bit more flexibility or I guess a little bit more co cohesiveness as far as the glucose and how it might kind of smooth things out a little bit better. And I think both of these studies do highlight normal resuscitation protocols for cats and making sure they're hydrated. And a lot of times that can be done pretty quickly over the first four to six hours of hospitalization. And then choosing one of these protocols, whichever you're most comfortable with and moving forward. But I certainly have been happy with the glargenine. And I think, you know, I see the other ICU side where I don't treat a lot of the long-term cats with in, um, diabetes, but our internal medicine specialists are very comfortable using glargenine, and that's a, probably the most common insulin we're using um, at this point. So it, it is usually the one that we're transitioning the cats to anyway once they're eating. And so it's kind of a nice um, starting point because we're going to go there for discharge anyway. Great discussion there, uh, panelists. We have a couple of great questions from our audience. Um, the first one, and I was waiting for someone to ask this, and I'm glad it was asked. So putting these two studies together, um, would you say the consensus would be that um, ideally you would, you would run a CRI at 2.2 units per kilogram, um, seeing how there was maybe no clinical benefit from the one unit uh, per kilogram uh, CRI protocol, um, and or, you know, at what point would you consider the um, regular insulin with a uh, glargine protocol? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. And um, again, although some of the sliding scale parts of the insulin CRI are a little different between the ICU and emergency doctors, we all um, use the 2.2 unit per K per 240 ml saline. Um, so that's very standard, I think, for the most part. There's been enough studies to support that. Um, and that, you know, taps you um, well on, on that type of CRI. I think that the times where I would particularly 
go for the glargine and the um, IM um, are those tests that maybe they're more moderate to severely affected patients um, because those tests are going to be the ones that may respond a little bit quicker. I think I have a little bit of a skewed opinion because most of the cases that get transferred to me in the ICU as a criticalist for DKA are typically those tests that are severely hypokalemic, they're hypophosphatemic, they're hypotensive, um, they're having a variety of electrolyte imbalances, um, and they may have really severe pancreatitis on top of a urinary tract infection, um, a lot of comorbidities. And so I'm dealing with a little bit more than just, you know, the cat that comes in that is uh, significantly ill, hypovolemic, and lateral because it's so dehydrated. And then 24 hours later, you know, kind of back on track, no minimal or no electrolyte abnormalities. Those cats, I think, would do well with the glarginine and the regular insulin, whereas a lot of the, the cats I see are kind of the, the, the extreme spectrum or the, the higher end of the severity spectrum, if that makes sense. No, I think uh, we're practicing pretty similar in that, um, you know, our hospital um, protocol is about every four hours um, and then potentially a little bit more frequently uh, initially on kind of, and I, I tend to tweak a lot. Um, so I look at where the mm -hmm. glucose is, how quickly it's been dropping or not, and then it kind of adjust based on that. But, you know, busy emergency doctors don't necessarily always have time. As you mentioned, we get busy doing other things and then things get missed. Um, and just as a reminder, we do have a evidence-based update looking at the alpha track accuracy. And um, one of my patients last week was a, a perfect example of that, where um, we just happened to do a BG and also draw for chemistry at the same time. And the, the alpha track way underestimated what the actual blood glucose was. Um, and unfortunately, the little formula that was presented in that paper didn't make it accurate, but at least it got us a little bit, bit closer. And we found that um, it's very similar um, in the cat, so even though we don't have that data, but uh, the alpha tract accuracy is not that great. So when you're getting in places where you want to be a little bit more cautious, like, you know, uh, difference between 90 and, and 60 is, can be huge. Um, and so um, when you're getting in those ranges, just remember about that.